going as you all in your city uh, begin to adapt this best practice, which I personally care passionately about. I'm with the Trust for Public Lands. I've been with them for 11 years, and um, we are a national nonprofit. And um, we are focused on parks and land conservation. And so I'm going to be talking today about the multiple benefits of parks. Um, here's our, our the top statement is what drives us every day. We create parks, protect land for people to use and enjoy, and create healthy, livable communities for generations to come. We've been around 45 years, deep history. Um, our headquarters is in San Francisco, and we've done quite a bit of uh, projects across the country in our 30 offices. Um, and we raise funds, we do research and planning, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later. We acquire and protect land. We help design and renovate parks, uh, playgrounds, trails, and um, gardens. I was going to note, we did a project recently in the city of Elk River. So who is our Elk River person? The, I am, but I just started. Okay. <laughs> so the Holton uh, Conservation Area, we helped with the transaction with the landowner and making that happen. We're working in the city of St. Paul very actively. Um, I think we did something in Hastings sometime but, uh, back, but I uh, just wanted to let you know, we've done quite a bit of work around the whole state of Minnesota, as well as in the Twin Cities. I lead our Twin Cities work. I work um, on our parks for people versus our land conservation. So there's kind of two, two chunks of work. Our land for people where think about bigger, land conservation, adding to uh, national parks or to state forests or to regional parks. Um, helping create new scientific and natural areas of the DNR, et cetera. So my focus is really in the parks for people, so thinking about parks for uh, people that live in cities. And we do that because of this. This is, I, I saw this cartoon years ago and it just made me sad, super sad. We do have a problem. Um, there are a lot of city residents. And as you know, the na uh, international trend is more people living in cities. So we have to make sure that those city dwellers are connected to nature, playground, or open space to create those values that then allow them to, to care passionately about other natural areas, the oceans and all those other natural areas. <coughs> one of the things that I would suggest is your best practice, uh, one of the actions is achieve a minimal level of city green space. I would argue this measurement of every resident in your city being within a 10 minute walk should be your goal. That's going to be our national goal of the Trust for Public Land. It's an achievable goal. In the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis, we're about 90, in the 90%. That still means there's 5% of people who are not within 10 minute walk of a park, and there are so many benefits to a park. And then I would add the, the type of park and the quality that matters as well. So what do we do? We help think about this 10 minute walk this metric, this best practice, and we help cities plan by doing some mapping, mapping of the 10 minute walk, um, walk shed, if you will, around parks, similar to high community areas, and then layer that with populations of needs, people of color, young children, low income, and then health factors. Where are there proponents of obesity, diabetes, chronic diseases? And we can do that mapping to create sort of ensuring that there's, that there's equitable access, 10 minute walk to a park. We help cities in um, developing the funding, the public funding for parks, in that um, we have helped across the country with uh, ballot initiatives. So bonds, property taxes, increases sales taxes for um, parks funding specifically. Create new parks or to create a funding stream for these new parks. We can acquire, help acquire land. I decided the Elk River example. We also um, have done two parks here, as I mentioned, Frogtown Park and Farm in St. Paul. Um, we're closely with the city of St. Paul and Frogtown, a new, new nonprofit called Frogtown Farm. And then we're actively working on a, a new project at uh, Green Street near University uh, Avenue. That's uh, kind of behind Wilder Foundation uh, and doing community engagement. So, to the topic at hand the multiple benefits of parks. I really think, um, in the 11 years I've been with the Trust for Public Land, I've sort of seen a sea change of perception of the value of parks. 
when I first started, parks were, they were nice to have. And there were mayors that said, hey, you know, if I had to, if I had to commit spending resources, I'm not going to worry about parks. You know? But I really think that the tide has changed. And it's in part because we're realizing that parkland isn't just for one person. We in more urbanizing areas where there's more um, constraints on funding, we need to be looking at our land to serve multiple uses, layered uses. So can it, can it manage stormwater? Can it provide recreation? Can it provide open space? Can it provide um, mitigation for heat, heat islands? It's these multiple benefits that I think people are now saying, we really do need to make sure that parks and green space are part of the fabric of our community. So that's really good to, to have seen that change. We use this, at the Trust for Public Land nationally, we use this, what we call the benefits flower. And I think it's a really great way of communicating. If you all can use this to uh, educate city council members, to talk to staff, to say, look, this is, there's multiple uses and benefits of parks. Feel free to use this. I can get it to you. It's on the website. I'm going to just quickly go through the flower and then open it up to questions because I prefer some questions up here as if I know it all because I don't. Because um, you all are in the cities and you know your cities. It doesn't matter. Health. Health is a benefit. People know that. It's sort of obvious. All of these in some ways are obvious. Hopefully you can see that. Fitness and recreation, we all know that. Mental well-being. There's a growing body of research, I'm looking at Kathy Jordan here, that um, is beginning to quantify the mental health benefits of parks and open space. Air and water quality. Um, those are uh, a growing body of information. We are creating a, a national health program in our organization to begin to really pull together all the research and give it out to the cities. We more and more will become a resource, not just doing project by project, but we have something called the Center for City Park Excellence, where as we pull out this research, we'll host it on something called Park Serve. So hope to go live with that by the end of 2017. Um, and it will include information like um, information about health care cost savings and how we arrive at that. More and more, we are beginning to quantify, sometimes in a somewhat of a proxy way, the cost savings for people who recreate at moderate to aggressive uh, exercise levels in park systems. And then if you use that and then go to the park and observe how many people are doing that, you suddenly get a dollar value. Um, this is a bad slide, sorry. $164 million in healthcare cost savings in a New York study. Okay, we start to quantify the healthcare benefits. So um, I'm not going to go into great detail on any of these because I just want to keep it short. Inspiration. I think sometimes we've been afraid to acknowledge that we need beauty in our lives, we need inspiration, we need space to breathe, space to have beautiful things, space for art, the value, intrinsic value of art, and parks can provide that. We have a program called Creative Placemaking. And that is about engaging student, uh, student people with artists to beautify parks, put sculpture in the parks, use parks as a canvas, if you will, for um, um, bringing culture to the park. So that's some of the new values we're bringing to this park. Here's a great picture. I think it just begins to get at it. There's a park called Capone Art Park in Egan. You may know that from the gentleman in the back. Um, we did this project years and years and years ago. Interesting man, loved art, wanted to, to keep it permanent as a park. Um, it's a beautiful example, great place making. It's a path of complete. Economy. Maybe everybody knows this. Um, actually, by background, I'm an economist, and so this is one of my passion areas. So I won't bore you with details, but we've done lots and lots of studies. And actually, locally, we did a Washington County study, we've done a Hennepin County study, um, and we've done a downtown Minneapolis study of the value of parks. And the methodology is pretty solid here. And nationally, our organization can do economic studies of whole city park systems. 
and say the economic value of the steel perk system is you know four billion dollars, and it's by adding up the values, health benefits, is adding up the values, recreation benefits, is adding up the ecological benefits, etc. Um, so more and more we can quantify this, and we feel this is important because as you're talking to policymakers in your city, sometimes it comes down to dollars and cents, and so. Um, it's really an important way of talking. We know, I mean, intuitively you know this, but more and more we are able to translate that the market value of properties that are adjacent or near parks have an increase in value. Um, there's about, I think it might be up to 130 studies across the country that show the magnitude of the impact is up to 20% for parks and up to 14% for trails. We see an increase in value for cleaner water. We see an increase in value for um, high quality parks that differs from, differs from low quality parks. So there's a, around every park, I think there's this buffer of increased value of houses and sometimes the commercial property groups. But it uh, pays off at, after about a quarter of a mile or um, so. We, uh, we have to be smart about it and, not, and be conservative in applying our uh, estimations of that. So we actually use five percent just for this. And of course, for policymakers, they care about this. We have an increase in value of parks, government tax revenue, which then helps you in your city and increase revenue for maintaining those parks. And I'm just glossing over this topic. I could spend the whole hour. Environmental benefits, I think this again also is um, important. Resiliency. I think more and more you're going to hear about how are cities seeing resilience for and building resiliency in response to increasing climatic changes, more frequent and more intense precipitation events, higher temperatures that create urban heat. These all have impact on our citizens and our residents and can do great damage. And so we we know that parks can be a play a role in resiliency. And we are building a climate smart cities approach to national infrastructure plan. I'm just starting to bring it here in the Twin Cities. Um, stormwater management, green infrastructure. It's, it's so funny because I've seen the term green infrastructure used through the years and uh, it's, its usage has evolved. But the way we think of green infrastructure is any bit of green that can absorb stormwater. Obviously you all know that. Um, and, and or slow its runoff. And there are more and more models that can be used to calculate it when it's um, being captured on parks and trails. And so I gave, I'm giving you an example here from uh, the city of San Jose in California. So in that city system, all their parks calculated that there was reduced runoff of 148 million cubic feet of stormwater. And looking at the cost of treating that stormwater in a gray infrastructure mechanism, which is about four cents per cubic foot, they, they, we can quantify what is the annual cost savings by not using gray infrastructure, but using green infrastructure to treat stormwater. So this is um, increasingly a pretty basic calculation. I think this is an important um, way of communicating to policymakers about the value of stormwater green infrastructure. And um, obviously there's air pollution removal. Um, yeah, I've got a cal calculation here again from the city of San Jose that looks at how many uh, tons of air pollution is removed uh, by parks and trails and then again put in a cost, uh, avoided cost basically uh, to that. And then community benefits. And I think sometimes we're loath to, you know, talk about the softer side of things. This, I think, is more and more important. Um, livability in cities is a increasingly important topic, and cities want to attract those people that care about amenities, that want to feel connected, that is in our increasingly um, internet driven world, the gig economy, you need to have a sense of community that uh, will help drive where you live. And so community values of equity, everybody feeling included, uh, engagement through creative placemaking is a great tool. Um, so again, um, City of San Jose, I just kind of had that data in my hands yesterday, but the community cohesion can also be measured. 
how many donated hours, um, and then putting a value on those things that donated hours. I think there are parts that are that already. And so that becomes a proxy for participation. More and more, I'm finding funders like Blue Cross Blue Shield is very interested in community cohesion, social cohesion, <coughs> um, understanding that health comes, that um, population health, public health is enhanced when there's a, a deep sense of co social co cohesion, being connected to your community, having a social network. So there's health benefits to the community as well. They're all interconnected. Um, so, how we can help the Trust for Public Land, um, sorry, I just had to take a little chance to do a commercial, sorry. Uh, these are kinds of areas of, of work that we do, identifying the most important lands for park making, helping create public funds for parks, uh, protecting land through acquiring it, and then helping create innovative parks where um, if, if a city needs help with that. We don't always, we aren't always needed. Um, in our planning work, here's just an example. This is from Park Score. Um, this is an example of we'll have these kinds of maps for all the first screen urban communities this year. This year, this is our 10-minute walk analysis, and uh, this will help us identify where there are park gap areas. And, uh, this is just a, a picture of in Denver where we. Um, had a bond referendum and really engaged the community in helping to um, get out the work to say, yeah, I really do. I'm, I'm willing to raise my taxes thirty dollars a year because I have a better system. So that's the kind of work that we do to help. Um, it's a great picture of National Land that we protected. Um, this is a park we created in Los, uh, Los Angeles. Um, this is a, a Latina. Latino community and a uh, beautiful piece of art that was created by a local artist that the, the children just love. It's a, it's a clay structure, but also a piece of art. So all these kinds of creative place making part creation things that we need to do. I have a couple of questions from um, the webinar. So uh, the it's sort of a two-part question. The first part is, do you include community gardens as part of your definition of park? Yes. Community gardens, community gardens are just one part of urban ag. And I think, interestingly, there's quite a bit of attention on community gardens, but there's so many other forms of urban ag. Um, for instance, at Frog Tom Park and Farm, we've got a 5.5-acre urban farm. And it isn't in the form of a community garden. The community garden most strictly is defined as somebody signs up to have a little two by eight plot that they garden themselves. Um, I think we need to think more broadly about urban ag and its role in in and on parks because community gardening is is great, but sometimes the little you know people move in and out of the community, and so stewardship is really important. To making sure there's an active program. Um, but yes, I would wholeheartedly agree there are stormwater benefits for community gardens, community benefits, community gardens, which is health benefits. So I yeah. Um, as a follow up to that, the same person, this is Terry Getz, he says, um, when I was the director of the Sacramento Community Garden Program in nineteen seventy five, I was told by the city parks head that it cost ten thousand dollars per acre a year to fully maintain a park, including the turf that we were actually saving the city money by having a community garden. Do you know if those numbers are still accurate and is there a calculator that computes the total economic value of a park and or community garden in terms of environment, health, property value, et cetera? Um, wow, there's a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good question. Very <laughs> good um, All right, I think there's a cost of park maintenance question. There's a, is there a calculator for all these benefits question? I think those are the two substantive subparts of the question. I'll take the first. Um, it's really hard to use proxies or um, averages for things like how much does it cost per acre to maintain a park because it really matters. I mean, we've got people in here that might know the answer to this question better than I do. We nationally kind of are loath to set out these kinds of numbers, numbers because it depends on the cost of living in a city, it depends on the type of park, the type of vegetation. 
John, do you have an answer? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, unfortunately there's no easy answer. Um, and on the other side, can we capture, is there an easy calculator for the benefit? There's not an easy answer. I will say, though, at the Center for City Park Excellence at the Trust for Public Lands, it's online, just Google Center for City Park Excellence, we have about mm, 15 economic studies that look at a big city park system, and they quantify. I mean, I just grabbed one of them today, the San Jose one, but there's other cities um, that you can start to see the pattern of the, all the varying types of um, economic benefits, and then we add up all the big Now, it's not necessarily going to apply to the city of Crystal like it does to the city of San Jose. It's a different city. But you can start to extrapolate. Um, maybe a best practice is, if this is a key question, maybe you start gathering data that helps you answer this question. That's not really an answer. It's not, there's no Yeah. Are there certain features a community should really think about and implement in any and all of their parks? I mean, I'm thinking about drinking fountains, parking. I mean, is there any list that any park should have? Um, I'm going to answer your question a little bit differently. I think it's important to know who your residents are and what they need. So. Uh, I would argue water is important, especially with an increasingly um, more hot climate. But um, I also would answer that we're seeing more diversity, different populations, different cultures coming into our parks. And I would say our challenge broadly is that our city parks, even our regional parks to some extent, met the needs of a population maybe 30 years ago. And you know, nuclear family, you know, affluent suburban communities, and it's really getting more diverse. And so we need to be thinking about the park design. You know, there's great Met Council, Metropolitan Council has done some great research on what are the emerging park needs of these new populations, like um, Hispanic communities need a bunching of uh, picnic benches because they like to have big family picnics, like 18, 20, 30 people come for a family picnic. And we put our little park bench, or park uh, picnic bench right there, and then there's another one 200 feet away that doesn't serve their needs. So um, those are maybe a couple water, a bunching of the, the picnic, or the, yeah, picnic benches, that kind of thing. Wasn't the quality bathrooms one of the top required features? Um, that's a request. I mean, sometimes it's tough providing bathrooms in small city park. That's tough. Uh, but I think more broadly, including in the process of park planning, a deep community engagement process that really gets at those communities, would be a better answer to your question. There's no single feature of a park that everybody should have. It's the process should be really, truly actively listening to people. And more and more, it's going out to them and getting translators. Yeah. Picking up on that question, are there things you see that are maybe trendy but not fitting with the research? For example, um, it seems like a lot of parks are having um, splash pads. Are there problems with this? Like, I'm curious your thoughts on things that are trendy but not really researching. Um, I, I'm probably maybe not the right answer. I'm more of an implementer. But our Center for City Park Excellence might be a, a great place to, to ask that question. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything against splash pads that are expensive. But I do think they're a great, again, a way to cool residents off. It's, they, they're a little safer than community pools, a little less expensive than community pools. Um, if done well, I think they really are a feature. Do you have any comment on that? I'm looking at the parks director in the room because you might have a perspective too. Well, no, like in Crystal, we've got four different kinds of parks. We're kind of getting back to the previous question. You know, neighborhood parks have different amenities than right. our, our community parks. They have the large walls and walls right. and like that. And their destination parks are kind of like, we're doing a study right now. We're looking at things like splash pads, the biggest parks, um, but not in every neighborhood park. 
Yeah, thank you, for John. For um, that made me think of something. At the park at Griggs, we are very carefully not going to put too many structured rec fields. I think that's another um, movement away. I shouldn't say movement away. There's important value in rec fields, but for some of these smaller parks, neighborhood parks, where we just want to encourage community gathering, so not marking off a soccer field, but just letting it be open grass and letting it be flexible especially also for those new sports that um, culturally we may not even know what they are yet. You know, there's a form of bocce ball that the Somali population plays. Okay, great. Well, let's leave an open field so that they can do that. Um, so it's those kinds of things where you just have to, again, think about who is it. A couple other questions from the webinar. One of them was back to the slide about San Jose. How is community cohesion value calculated? Yes. So um, there's money donated to the park, so that's an example of community commitment. Well, some community foundations, individuals that live in the community. Um, when we build a park, we actually have a kind of GoFundMe type site, so we'll look at that as a, you know, a sort of measure of community co cohesion of how many people gave their $5 or $10 online to, to build the park. Um, number of hours donated, putting a value on each volunteer hour, pretty, you know, pretty good value of volunteer hour, and then calculating that all together. So that's how, in this case, community cohesion is measured. I would argue that there's no corner or truth here. I mean, there might be other measures of community cohesion. Um, uh, how many times? How many times? People, how many people show up at community meetings at first? That's a measure of community cohesion as it relates to parks, or even the engagement level in other city processes is a measure of community cohesion. Um, so that's our probably our best measurement in terms of dollars and cents. But I think there's other ways to measure sort of qualitatively how 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 cohesive do people feel? Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, a question about homelessness in parks. I, I think back to growing up. I grew up in Los Angeles, and in the 60s, it was, a little, it was kind of a little sketchy, the, the neighborhood parks that I would go to. As I've returned in, late, in, you know, in the last like 20 years, it's like, this is not a problem. So it's really changed, and, and I moved to Minnesota, and it's like, yeah, it's sort of not an issue. But is that a, is that a, do you find that as a very conscious sort of planning issue concern, or not so much? Well, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. Um, people, that's a kind of part of a broader safety in parks yeah. sort of um, <clears throat> aspect, and um, I think broadly the idea of the more eyes on the park, the better. The more people that are coming to the park, the more people that are looking at the park, you're generally going to have more safe. So, and more people that own own it. So, if there's a friends of group, then they're going to be out there cleaning. They're going to be cutting back any vegetation that's growing that would be like cover for homeless. I just heard about um, again this park that we're building in St. Paul. The um, uh, we the city cleared vegetation off the fence line. And then before that, there was somebody homeless kind of sleeping under this little uh, set of vegetation. And after it's clear, that person wasn't sleeping there anymore. Um, so I think, again, it goes back to the degree of maintenance, uh, how it's designed. There's a whole thing called SEPTED, which is stands for community. There's a program that's. Um, Safety is part of the design. Yeah, design. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. SEPTED, which thinks about safety as you're designing. And then um, uh, friends of groups, cleanups. It's all of those things together that I think maybe has changed, that there's more investment in parks. It's not just sort of passively yeah, land you know, set aside with big are, benches. Yeah. You know, now they're, they're more structured, there's more activity, there's more uh, attention to parks. And so I think that's mitigated to an extent. But that question of safety, the lesser extent homelessness, but that question of safety comes up a lot. Um, yeah. 
And I think a community uh, input on it helps also in that if I help create what's in this park, I, I feel like I want to make sure it's used wisely and not defaced. For instance, I was just at Frogtown Park and Farm. There's no graffiti around. I was pleased to see that. I think it's because it felt so well loved by the city. Yeah. Is there any thoughts or help? I mean, we decided we were going to put a trail up the top of Pete's Hill, which is the highest point in Scott County. And from the time we started till the time we finished, the cost really escalated because of ADA uh, regulations. The trail ended up seven times as long as what we thought to meet the, all the switchbacks up the hill. And uh, we still did it, and it's a it's turning out beautifully, but it's uh, a lot more costly and had to clear a lot more trees and stuff than we originally wanted to do. So do you have a question? What's well, question the, the, the question was, is that, how, 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 when you, how do you, it, are, are there places to get information right off the bat on this ADA stuff before you even get I think a lot of people might have dropped the idea if it had it was start the idea was started by the scouts. They wanted to put the trail in with wood chips and by the time all the regulations got done, it ended up into almost a hundred thousand dollar project. <laughs> no wood chips. No wood chips. But, I mean Go ahead, Jeff. So as I said, there's different standards from building, built environment and recreation. Environment you're not going to pay the trail up to the top of the mountain. There's some reasonable accommodations. So there's a little bit more wiggle room in the, in the natural. Yes, exactly. exactly. Um, you know, and that may be, I think I'll say this public work sometimes feels like they have to do everything to make sure it's safe. And that it may be that there's some sort of element of feeling, well, if we're going down this path, pardon the pun, then we need to make sure that it's completely safe. I don't know what happened here. Uh, you know, it sounds like a feeling our engineering firm got involved. Consultants <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and but I know it just it just escalated far beyond what we well, hopefully you take heart today and you know that there are a lot of other benefits that are going to accrue in the next 25 years from that path. We're already looking at the scouts reforesting and putting in natural plants okay. where they took everything out going up the hill okay. and doing a few other things that way with volunteers. It was a great volunteer opportunity. Great, which is community cohesion. Yeah, getting people aware. Yeah, questions there. Questions about community capacity and that community cohesion? I'm wondering if you have a, a story or two or creative ideas or tips that, that help build that community cohesion. Just thinking about Emerald Ash Borer and Monarchs and uh, carbon sinks and water, great environmental education opportunities, but where are the bridges you know, that, that build that capacity to get people there? Do you have any fun creative ideas? You know what? I'm going to let the other two speakers talk to this because um, I think they're closer to that kind of building bridges with children with um, through community engagement. I mean, I could go on for a long time about community engagement. I'm in the midst of a very deep community engagement project, and it's really fun and really fascinating um, because it's that we're going out to them and listening to them about those things that are passionate and then figuring out how to get them, uh, those passionate people to play a role. And I think that's the simple answer. I don't have a specific story right With that, shall we switch over? Sounds good. Could you take one more time? Sure. Um, are there any games and activities that you have to do in the park for as like a very intentional break? I'm interested how that is preferred. That's a great question. Um, by the way, 10 minute walk is a really great communication message to people immediately. Right um, Parks for People has, has been for 45 years at the heart of the Trust for Public Land. It's because we um, we actually are an offshoot of the Trust um, of the Nature Conservancy, where they really care about 
and more biodiversity, if you will. We needed to distinguish ourselves. We truly believe about creating something of, of caring about in people. And that, so we care about working farms, we care about working ranch lands, we care about forestry projects, any, any place where nature and humans are interacting. So um, it's just been in our DNA. So good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Kathy Jordan. I am the uh, Director of Research for the Children and Nature Network, and I'm also a faculty member at the University of Minnesota in the Center for Community Vitality and Extension and also in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, I want to give one caveat, which is that I'm going to be talking about this project, Please Connecting Children to Nature, and one of its strategies, the Green Schoolyard Strategy. Um, but these are not my projects at Children and Nature Network. I happen to be the local Children and Nature Network person and was asked to talk about these. But um, So I'll try to field your questions, but I'm not the one that's actually responsible for them. So, um, so this project, uh, Cities Connecting Children to Nature, is a collaborative effort between Children and Nature Network and the National League of Cities. I'm sure you know the National League of Cities. For those of you who don't know Children and Nature Network, uh, its mission is to uh, lead the movement to connect all children, their families, and communities to nature through innovative ideas, evidence-based resources and tools, broad-based collaboration, and support of grassroots leadership. Um, so two of its central initiatives are the Cities Connecting Children to Nature and its Green Schoolyards Initiative. And what I'm going to talk about today is really the intersection of the two and sort of a new, newly named project that's called Green Schoolyards for Healthy Communities. And the idea here is uh, focusing on the municipal support uh, for the development of and then widespread use of the green schoolyard for the benefit of the community. So let me give a little bit of an overview here of uh, the Cities Project. I'm going to call it Cities for short instead of uh, Cities Connecting Children to Nature. Um, so this is a project that has uh, at least initial funding from the JPP. JTB Foundation, and it works to uh, it works with cities to nurture um, or to ensure that a connection to nature becomes an integral part of city priorities, city planning, um, policy making around a range of areas. Things having to do with community health and wellness, youth development and out of school time, education, job creation, transportation, uh, and land use. And it has a special emphasis on low income and communities of color. So where did this idea come from? It really was a response to four trends um, related to um, obesity and the sort of uh, chronic health conditions associated with obesity. Um, it came from trends related to increased school time. I'll give you a little bit more information about these in a minute. Increased incidence of stress, uh, particularly in, in children. Um, and then less commitment to stewardship um, in the current generation. So these were the sort of uh, impeti, I guess you would say is the plural form of impetus. Um, these were the impeti for the creation of the city's project. So um, I want to talk briefly about some of the evidence. Uh, Kaiser Family Foundation uh, did a study and put out a report on the fact that kids are spending on average across the ages 50 hours a week connected to some sort of device. That's like a full-time job. I mean, that's kind of amazing, right? It's, um, it is really, truly really amazing. And even when you consider that, um, like <laughs> multitasking, being on your laptop and texting with sort of double, you know, double count. But even with that, it's still an amazing number of hours that kids are connected to devices. And then, sort of the, the flip side of that is kids are spending 90% of their time indoors these days, which is a huge change from from previous generations. Um, connected is this, this finding that over the last 30 years, the obesity rate in children has gone from 7% to 18 and in some, time, some, in some communities, uh, lower income and uh, communities of color is as much as 20%. Uh, percent. And for some communities, that figure has been leveling off and for others, it's not leveled off. This is sort of a mental health issue. Um, I don't know if you know that preschoolers are the sort of latest uh, target market, so to speak, for antidepressant medication. 
we're giving like Ritalin uh, to younger and younger children. Um, and this is sort of a marker, or at least the belief is that stress is just sort of working its way down on the younger and younger phases of childhood. So with these areas of uh, you know, concerning trends, the Cities Project was born. And uh, this, is the this is the theory of change. The idea here is that with the focus on increasing the leadership uh, capacity and leadership engagement of cities, uh, increasing access to green space, doing engagement with the community in a, in a different and a better way, that these things will lead to more equitable and abundant connections to nature for all of the reasons that Jennifer talked about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the research on that, but she did a great job of laying out, at least for, for uh, parts, what, what the evidence suggests. Does that make sense to folks, the, the theory of change? Um, so this is the uh, initiative goals. Um, this project is really twofold. The idea here is to support municipal leaders um, in creating nature-rich opportunities on um, environments for healthy child development um, and increasing the number of low-income and minority children who are playing and learning in nature. And then secondly, to create a resource hub of research and promising practices or models to inform community impact. And I'll give you a website at the end uh, where you can access a report, which is the beginning of that resource hub. But they are working on creating an online environment for that. Um, so there's four areas of program activities for the Cities Project. Um, the first one was a nationwide city scan. Um, the second is leadership academies. The third are planning grants, pass-through money that are then tied to uh, technical assistance. So let's talk briefly about the, the city scan. Um, this was a scan done a couple of years ago with 68 cities and 42 community organizations. Uh, it was a survey that examined what's happening sort of uh, in and with cities related to policies, programs, partnership resources, and barriers. I'm not going to talk uh, right now about the results of that. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but we'll kind of circle back a little bit um, later to some of those findings. So that scan led to an understanding that we needed to build the capacity of leaders. And so in 2015, there were two leadership capacity building um, academies. Um, uh, some of our folks were here. Um, for example, Faith from St. Paul um, was at one of those, at the St. Paul one. Um, and these academies train city teams um, to, on planning tools, promising practices, results-based examples in the areas of policies, programs, partnerships, and leadership strategies. Now, these 16 cities uh, were the ones that uh, participated or were chosen out of a competitive process of 43 applications. And those are the names of those 16 cities. Those cities were then um, eligible for applying for pass-through money um, and technical assistance. And these cities, Austin, Grand Rapids, Louisville, Madison, Providence, St. Paul, and San Francisco, were the seven cities that were then awarded implementation and planning grant money um, along with technical assistance. Now, um, that technical assistance had to do with building capacity, identifying sort of community assets and gaps, um, and implementing stra key strategies for sustainable access to nature among children, particularly uh, in economically stressed communities. Each of these cities, you can see, has developed a set of strategies or, or sort of chosen, not necessarily from a menu, but they, they're sort of cohering around a set of strategies um, that have to do with, um, I'll call them targets of action. And they have to do with things like green schoolyards, uh, youth development and out of school time, uh, early childhood education, um, parks. Um, and then they're also leveraging some combination of strategies at the mayoral level. Um, policy level communications and community engagement strategies. So what I'm going to do next is sort of zero in on the green schoolyard strategy, which five of the seven communities have chosen um, as an important strategy in their plan. And then after I'm done, Faith is actually going to talk about the city of St. Paul's involvement in this initiative and focusing in on a strategy called, uh, are we talking about natural libraries or nature, nature smart libraries, right? Yeah, nature smart libraries. Okay, so, oops, sorry about that. Okay, 
So the state of schoolyards today, most schoolyards look something like this, maybe with a little bit of turf, <laughs> uh, but traditional playground equipment and maybe some space to, to run around. But what if schoolyards look something like this, where you've got uh, lots, lots of vegetation, you've got natural play areas, um, et cetera. What are green schoolyards? So Children and Nature Network and the Cities Project are thinking about green schoolyards as multifunctional spaces on school grounds that might include um, or, or, or are geared to the needs of students, teachers, parents, and community members around play, learning, recreation, exploration, growth, relaxation. And they could, they could include a combination of these sorts of features, things like outdoor classrooms, uh, native gardens, managing stormwater runoff, which uh, Jennifer talked about. They might include traditional play equipment, but also nature play spaces, vegetable gardens. Uh, they could include trails or trees. Uh, it could have a community garden site. Um, it might also include things like um, sand and water features, or an important thing that has been shown in the, in the literature is to have loose parts. So loose parts are things like sticks and rocks and uh, sand and trees, and, or uh, not trees, you can't move trees, but uh, things that come off of trees, pine cones and leaves, uh, things that kids can drag around and sort of make up their own game. Okay, so that, that sort of multi-component and multi-functional and multi-audience approach is what we are considering to be uh, sort of a best practice in green schoolyards. And ideally, um, these green schoolyards are used by multiple sectors um, of the community. So in this example, you've got some traditional athletic um, fields and equipment um, like that might be used by um, an out-of-school time sports league, um, as well as the community. And then you've got sort of the, over on the right there, um, it's kind of hard to see, but you, you see that that's a designed area. That's a natural play space that, of course, is used by the school, um, but is also open to the community to use uh, on weekends and whenever school is, is not in session. So that's the idea of a, a multi-use um, sort of situation, or a hybrid sort of situation that serves multiple audiences. <laughs> So the benefits of green schoolyards, this is my version of the, the flower, this is the wheel um, that the green schoolyards uh, folks have created. And um, I'm not going to talk a lot about um, uh, all of these individually, but um, I just want to mention that despite all these benefits that I'll mention, only 11% of schoolyards in the community have anything like a green schoolyard. So we are way way down um, on uh, the scale there in terms of what it could look like, and there are big disparities in which schools and which communities do have green schoolyards, and it is the disparities that you would expect. Lower income and uh, communities of color tend to have less access to the green schoolyard. So I don't know if you can see these, but the, um, the areas that um, have been identified as beneficial from green schoolyards are academic performance, physical activity, mental health, beneficial play, social emotional skills, nutrition education from things like the garden, uh, water management, shade canopy, wildlife habitat and sort of biodiversity, uh, environmental literacy, community peacemaking, which kind of goes around with the social cohesion, uh, and family engagement. Um, the, I would say that the uh, Green Schoolyards Healthy Communities uh, theory is that Greening the space on school grounds, which is the only uh, public land specifically allocated for the use of children, um, will have a lasting impact on children, their families, and the communities in these various, various areas. And that theory of change comes from research. And I want to point out that I see several of you have these, but if you don't have them, there are two sets of infographics on the table. Um, that were developed by, uh, through my work at the Children and Nature Network, and they summarize in sort of graphic and bullet point form the research around green schoolyards, and um, this one is about academic outcomes, there's one about health benefits, there's one about physical activity, and there's one about beneficial play. Um, I'll give you a website at the end where you can find downloadable forms of these in black and white and color and cropped versions and not cropped versions and things like that. So this summarizes the evidence, and the evidence is burgeoning um, about green schoolyards, but beyond that as well, there are additional infographics on nature and health and nature and 
academic outcomes available at the CNN website. When Rich Liu wrote the book Last Child in the Woods 10 plus years ago, he was basing that on about 20 to 25 studies that were consistent about kids in nature, not specifically green schoolyards, but including green schoolyards. And today, we um, just entered our 500th study into the Children and Nature Network's research library, where we have summaries of uh, the scientific literature. So the research is burgeoning, and it is all pointing in the same direction. There's never been a study that has shown that nature is bad for you. <laughs> um, we still need to know more, um, but there's lots of research that is supporting um, that wheel um, that I talked about a few moments ago. Okay. So. Um, this is a uh, graphic here of the strategies of uh, implementing successful green schoolyards for those benefits um, and utilizing those various sort of um, strategies that I mentioned before in terms of the various audiences, multi-use, you know, things like that. The idea here is that, I hope you can see the black, it's a little bit hard to see, it says school support, design in the middle column, and then community engagement. Um, and so school support is the idea that there is strong support from administrators, uh, teachers, and that there's training for teachers to understand how to integrate the green schoolyard into curriculum. It's nature play, yes, but it also, to really serve its full purpose and to be very valuable to the school, it needs to also be able to be utilized for the academic mission of the school as well. Um, and then the other piece of that is the ongoing maintenance, um, which can be a barrier, but doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, one of the most important things uh, in the design of this is to really work with maintenance staff uh, to help them understand what goes into maintaining a green schoolyard. And you may cut way down on things like lawn mowing, uh, but you may have to do some weeding. You know, there's, there are trade-offs. The middle uh, column there around design um, is the idea that there are evidence-based best practices around designing green schoolyards, um, and one of them includes a participatory approach of including the potential users uh, in the design of that. And so really tapping into what the children want, you can do that from pre-K you know, all the way up. Uh, talking with teachers and administrators, parents, the greater community that might also um, utilize that space. And then designing for environmental impact is that idea of, you know, we can also do things like manage stormwater. Um, we can create rain gardens, and those rain gardens, for example, help manage stormwater, but they can also be used for biodiversity, they can also be used for uh, the academic mission around um, environmental li literacy and ecology and, and things like that. And all of these are undergirded by some foundational elements that have to do with supporting, po supporting policy, sustainable funding, and strategic partnerships. And I'll just mention a few ideas around those. So policies and funding sources. Um, so policies are sort of levers. You know, what can you utilize to incentivize changes around greening schoolyards? So for example, uh, park walkability scores you know, can be used um, in order to get uh, parks to sort of change something about the way they do their, their work. Um, not in our community, but in some other communities around the country, the quality rating scale um, measures of early childhood uh, uh, centers and preschools have worked in nature play as one of the criteria for getting five stars, for example. So that incentivizes those child care centers to create nature play. It also draws families to those centers that have done that because they see that that's, you know, made it as one of the highest quality uh, preschools in their area. Um, things like uh, policies around um, recess and around physical activity, um, those sorts of requirements, when you can demonstrate that the green schoolyard actually increases the amount of physical activity you know, kids are demonstrating throughout the school day, you've got another incentive for schools to, um, to green their schools. The shared use or joint use agreements, these are uh, things like making an agreement between uh, the school and the city parks, or the school and an assisted living facility, or the school and uh, the sports league in town um, to sort of jointly use that space in a way that meets everyone's needs and maybe also creates a multi-stream, you know, multi-source stream of funding. Funding might come from a variety of sources. Um, you know, we mentioned donors, which I don't think we necessarily have up here other than the corporate ones, but um, corporate donors, individual donors, uh, green infrastructure funds, municipal funds, um, community development block grants, conservation funds, you know, legacy money, you know, for instance, in our state. 
potential partners. And this is sort of a, a, a generic list. Um, obviously, in different uh, places, we'll have uh, unique partnership opportunities. But you know, the water agencies, the park um, agencies, uh, at various levels, we get to have national park um, opportunities as well as city and county. Mayor's offices, uh, community organizations, transportation and planning departments, school districts, um, the superintendent's office, capital improvements, curriculum departments, evaluation units, um, health departments, nonprofits. Um, I would say um, cultural organizations, particularly as you talked about the research around people are using spaces differently depending on their sort of ethnic traditions and how their culture connects to nature um, as part of their tradition. Um, universities, particularly around evaluation and research, and after school program providers. So the website at the top there, childrenandnature.org slash school yards, is the website for the Green School Yards initiative. Um, and you will find there a report, uh, Building National Movements for Green School Yards in Every Community. Um, it's a great report on um, municipal strategies, but for others as well. You can also find those infographics specifically about green schoolyards on that website. Um, more general information, including the infographics about nature and education and nature and health, can be found on the resources link um, of CNN's website, which is just childrenandnature.org. So um, I will stop there, leave up my um, contact information. You know, feel free to connect with me. Um, about any of this work or anything having to do with research, since that's my role um, with CNN. And let's open it up to some questions. And I'll do my best, given this is in my project. <laughs> I have a question from the webinar. Um, the Green School Yard project is quite exciting, and I agree fully with the benefits you list in the wheel and the infographic sheets based on my experience with Sacramento. I was wondering about the cities chosen for funding by um, the cities connecting children to nature because they seem to be mainly progressive cities that are probably already investing in involved in schoolyards. I was wondering if there is any work going on in cities that are more challenged than places like Austin, San Francisco, and St. Paul. Um, I'm, I'm sure there is work going on in, in other cities. Um, I don't have great examples of that, and I don't know. Um, specifically how these cities were chosen. Um, it had something to do with the plans that they were putting forward. Uh, also the fact that they are, they are kind of medium-sized cities. You know, these aren't the huge, huge metro areas, um, but they are big enough to really get some impact. Um, but they are small enough to really uh, make their plans feasible, I guess would be the way to put that. And that, I think, was an intentional strategy on the National League of Cities and Children and Nature Network's part in choosing those. Um, I think it might just be a byproduct of self-selection into this process that uh, these cities might be some of the more progressive ones. Um, I don't think they were chosen um, because of that. I think it's who, who applied. Um, so I don't have great examples of cities that you might think of as less progressive or less invested um, in doing this work. But I do know that there are at least um, some isolated examples of these sorts of things happening. Um, actually, if you go to the archives of Children and Nature Network's blog posts, there are examples um, highlighted um, through our social media and, and blogs about good things that are happening in different parts of the country and the world. And I think there might be some examples um, embedded within that communication. I'm not, they're not coming to mind right now. I'm thinking back to my own experience with, with uh, schools and parks and schoolyards. We had a um, we had a park that was it had a classic asphalt up here, and then there was a a, a bowl like an arroyo and a stream running through it. And, and so I, I remember, you know, on the on the playground, people would come back with skin beads, and then in the, in the, in the bowl we called it. You know, people would like fall in the water. Right, you come back dirty, right? Yeah, come back <laughs> dirty. Um, and I don't know, you know, in the 50s, no one, 60, no one really thought about it. But I, are there issues of like, oh, people in nature playgrounds are getting like, you know, eyes poked where? Yeah. It's, so the, again, it's sort of the safety. Uh, yeah. So the safety issue is really interesting, and um, 
there's actually, if you're not aware of the, uh, I guess we call it Hamlin, um, where they're blanking on the law school right down on Grand Avenue. Oh. Mitchell, Mitchell Hamlin. Mitchell Hamlin now has a Center for Law and Public Health or something close to that title. They have a specialty of uh, working with people around risk and liability in nature place spaces. Really, really great resource. Um, yeah, and they have done some presentations, and I remember some of the things uh, that they talked about. Think about uh, a traditional playground structure where you've got kids going down a slide or they're climbing and there are all these rules and regulations around things like um, the fall zone, you know, the clearance, you know, around the slide, for example. If you built a slide into the side of a hill, there's no fall zone. You don't even need to worry about that. Um, there are many examples where the natural play space can actually be an antidote to some of the risks that are inherent in some of the traditional playground equipment. And I, I'm not an anti-playground equipment person. I personally believe that uh, kids have different levels of skill and interest in different kinds of play experiences, and that it's most important to cater to essentially a variety. Um, and girls and boys in different ages use um, outdoor space differently. So um, traditional play equipment really does have its purpose. but we shouldn't think of that as more safe than the natural part. Um, you know, just because there's a stick lying on the ground doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be used as a weapon any more likely than, you know, uh, there'll be a fall off the slide or something like that. Um, and there are, um, I think, ways to mitigate some of those risks, um, but the research has demonstrated that rarely are there actually injuries. Um, it, it just, it's not a huge concern. So is that Oh, yeah, no. I, mean, I remember injuries in both. You know, they had the swings had those like heavy chains. Yeah, and, and the swings you, know, you knock up. somebody over, as you go back and forth, or you fall off. Yeah, there's there's yeah. lots of risk involved in playgrounds, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think, uh, and to some degree, there are some risks involved in the nature play space. They're little, they're a little bit different, um, different and yeah. um, uh, in general, they're no more uh, risky than than the traditional playground, and they have uh, the, the benefits definitely sort of outweigh the risks. The, the, depending on how you know, sort of um, how natural you get, you know, if you allow a lot of water and mud play and you know that sort of thing, the, the greater thing is that you're going to have some parent pushback on how dirty the kids come home. So it's a little bit more about helping parents understand why that's a good thing. Um, and you know, we, in terms of the benefits of you know active outdoor play and construction play and you know creativity and the social emotional learning that goes along with working together to build a bridge across the muddy stream or you know something like that. Um, so, so it's a little bit of a mindset you know for, for parents to change their minds. Um, but we also know from the research that we used to say you know cleanliness, you know don't get dirty, that's like bad germs kind of stuff. And now the research is demonstrating that the dirtier you get, the better your immune system is. So we, we've got to sort of switch Switch public opinion about dirt. <laughs> it's it's not another program or a the the law uh, for public. That is a. It's, I think it's called the Center for Law and Public Health or Public Health Law or something like that. So it's a it's a program within the law school. Are there any examples or showing what the difference in cost of maintenance is between something more traditional mm -hmm. to the nature type? Um. There may be, it really depends on what the features are in both of those um, sort of settings. Um, you know, how much, uh, in, in a traditional space, you know, how much turf, you know, are you trying to mow and fertilize and, and that sort of thing um, versus, you know, in the natural play area, are you, you know, sort of converting uh, a wooded area um, into an area that kids can play in and build forts and that sort of stuff? Very little maintenance there. You know, there's not much you need to do there. Uh, maybe you know, build some trails, but then you're you're okay. Um, if you've got a lot of gardens that need to be manicured, you know, weeded and you know, invasive species kept out and and that sort of thing, then your your staff cost might be a little bit higher. But I think there's also um, be, because particularly with green schoolyards that are multi-use, multi-audience you can get more folks involved in sort of this community engagement sort of way to come in and do some maintenance. Um, there's a great example at Bruce Bento School here um, 
in St. Paul of the community sort of rallying around that school's effort to put in school gardens. And so the community is the one that is maintaining the gardens over the summer, um, along with a police liaison officer who lives, um, or I guess maybe not, doesn't live, but that's her beat, so to speak. And it's this great community building uh, opportunity for the community that otherwise didn't have a great relationship with the police um, to work together with the school to maintain these gardens over the summer and get them ready for harvest for the kids in the, in the fall. Does that answer your question or any follow-up? Yep. Um, I'm not sure I understand. But the question is, are there any risk studies on eating food from the garden? Um, I don't know that there's studies per se about that. But of course, um, you want to use best practices. You know, um, typically these gardens would probably be organic. You're not going to be, you know, utilizing a lot of, you know, pesticides, you know, sort of thing. Um, they're often utilized um, to teach things uh, that have to do with things like you know, sustainable agriculture or, you know, organic um, gardening or organic farming. Um, you want to make sure that when you put in, for instance, a school garden that you're either doing raised bed or you're testing the soil. You want to make sure you don't have lead in there or, you know, arsenic or some of the things that can be found in soil. But with sort of best environmental uh, health practices, there shouldn't be, you know, issues around. On the other side. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're busy. Uh, my name is Faith Crockett. I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator for the City of St. Paul. And I've also been the team lead for the City's Connecting Children to Nature initiative for the city. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in St. Paul, but I really wanted to emphasize the process because every city is different, and I'm hoping that um, just by talking through the process, this, it might elucidate how you might do this in your city. The question we wanted to answer in St. Paul is how could St. Paul better and more equitably connect children to nature? And in particular, we were really interested in those uh, low-income in, low communities and communities of color. And we're interested also in something that we refer to as nearby nature. So what is that experience when you walk out your door? Uh, what does it look like? Uh, what does it feel like? Um, our team is composed of a number of City of St. Paul staff from the Mayor's Office, Parks Department, Libraries. We also have uh, folks from the National Park Service, the YMCA, and we had a number of community researchers join our team at a certain point, and I'll talk about them later. Um, in your city, if you put together a team to look into this, you might consider bringing on somebody from public health, from the school district, uh, from business, uh, local businesses, civic, organizations, etc. So during our planning phase, we really wanted to find out you know, how are we doing in St. Paul already? Uh, what are those assets, gaps, opportunities, and barriers? And we did a number of things we called the data dive just to find out what data is out there, what can we learn about the, the people who live here, um, what is happening. Um, we also were interested in learning about out of school time. We have a really strong out-of-school time network called Sprockets in St. Paul, and so we were interested in talking to the youth workers and program managers there to find out what they were doing for Nature Connection. And then we also wanted to do a policy scan to look at opportunities for uh, nudging our policies toward uh, more Nature Connection. And then my personal favorite is the community research that we conducted um, in New Brand Nature. So I'm just going to touch on this very briefly, um, but when you look at St. Paul and you look at the <coughs> places that we have in the city, we have wonderful parks and the Trust for Public Land has uh, mapped out our city and we have, most of our residents live within a 10 minute walk of park. And we actually were number one tied with Minneapolis in 2015 for the park system, number one park system in the United States. Um, dropped to number two in 2016 and we'll see what happens in 2017. Um, but we're really proud of our parks and we really invest a lot in our parks. Um, and we've got great partnerships. Um, this is a picture from Frogtown Farm, uh, Park and Farm. Um, we worked with the Children and Nature Network to renovate our Sunray Library into a Nature Smart Library is what we ended up calling it. 
uh, we wanted to open up that building, have more windows, have more nature access. It also had to do with the programs um, that were offered as part of the, the library programming. Um, there, were, there's a, there was a natural leaders training to develop youth leadership. Uh, there's a pollinator garden installed on site and more trees were planted on the, the grounds. Um, and there are also nature adventure backpacks, everyone's favorite thing that you can check out and go learn about urban birds, et cetera. And then we also, uh, we, we have a Vibrant Places and Spaces initiative in the city to look at how can we activate different areas, uh, get people outside and engaging with each other. And this is just one example. We have a, a skating rink that we put up in the winter down in downtown uh, to get people outside. We put out temporary saunas um, in our at street corners, um, so all kinds of, of fun things like that. We have great programs. I'll mention the environmental education program, wonderful. Um, that's my program, that's why I'm talking about it. Uh, we also have a volunteer coordinator who engages thousands of people in our regional park uh, as, as volunteers to uh, do habitat restoration and, and things like that. We have a youth job corps. Our police department works with youth and gets them outside fishing and things like that. And then we have, a, we're lucky to have a lot of partnerships in the city, and this is a, a partial list, but I just wanted to call out a few really important partners that we have. Wilderness Inquiry has these beautiful Voyager canoes, and they, they bring tens of thousands of people out onto the Mississippi River. Um, the, the National Park Service works with people, um, with fifth graders on the Big River journey on the Mississippi River also. The 17-mile stretch of the Mississippi that runs through St. Paul is part of a national park, which is a little known fact. Uh, but we have these great park rangers here in St. Paul. We also work with the YMCA and the Department of Natural Resources to get kids outside. We also wanted to look at you know, who lives in our city. And there's a lot of data out there, and you can slice this so many different ways. And I just wanted to show you one uh, of my favorite maps. The library put together a language map of the city. And it's a little, a little complicated, but if you forget about the, the pie charts for a minute and just look at those census blocks, the darker the color, that's the higher, a higher percentage of people who speak a language other than English at home. So the dark red areas there, that's greater than 50%. That's between, I believe it's 53 and 63% of people speak a language other than English at home. And then the pie charts show what that primary language is that's spoken at home. And so blue is English, green is Hmong, pink is Karen, um, and you can go down the list, but just by glancing at it, you can see if you just look for the green parts of the pie chart, you can see uh, where the concentrations of people who speak Hmong live in our city. And I just want to call out um, this area right here. In our community research, we really focused on this, this area because of the, the diversity um, in that part of the city. We did a policy scan, and it's a big P, little p policy. And I just wanted to call out a couple of things that we um, are, are wanting to impact. We have a sidewalk grid completion <coughs> policy. So our sidewalk grid is incomplete in our city. And we need to find out and figure out how can we prioritize which parts of that sidewalk grid do we want to complete first. Um, and we were able to put a clause in there to prioritize sidewalks near parks that otherwise would not have been prioritized. Uh, we also have a lot of emerald uh, we have a lot of ash trees in our city, emerald ash borer. We're going to be removing a lot of trees, and so looking at where are we going to replant trees, uh, what we'd like to do is look at, you know, instead of taking them out of the parks and putting them back exactly where they were in the first place, maybe we want to be more intentional about looking at maybe uh, a tree would be better sited near a playground or near a park bench or a picnic table um, to, to shade those areas and and encourage uh, more, more people to engage in those spaces when they're shade in the right. <coughs> um, we did a, an out of school time survey, and what we found with our youth workers is that there's a lot of variability. Some youth workers are outside all of the time, right? Others never want to leave that air conditioned, uh, climate controlled space. Um, but we, what we found is there's a lot of interest in professional development in terms of getting kids outside. Um, learning about resources that are available, uh, locations to go, transportation, et cetera. And now to my favorite, the community research piece. 
So what we wanted to do was uh, really find out from communities of color in our city uh, how they engage with the outdoors. And we were intentional about using, uh, not using the word nature because that means different things to different people, but we wanted to be more broad and talk about being outside. So here are the interview questions and they really get to, you know, what do people do and the locations they go, what, what do they see as the benefits of being outside, what are those barriers, and um, what do they want that they're not able to access. So we hired four community researchers, and I, I use the term community researchers because these were not professionals. Um, in fact, here in this picture, um, here's our Latina community researcher, 19 years old, um, wonderful because she could talk to teenagers and she could talk to adults. Um, her dad actually helped out a lot and had great suggestions for where to find people to interview in that neighborhood that we were that I was pointing out. Um, and they settled on laundromats because a lot of times people don't have anything better to do than talk to somebody in the room. That was just genius. Um, but what the what these researchers were able to do was re reach a community that we weren't we're not necessarily great at reaching. Um, so we had a mom, a woman who spoke mom, an African American man, a Latino woman, and then we had a group of youth in uh, Urban Roots who interviewed each other and then also went to rec centers to interview other youth. They did 92 interviews and uh, they used iPads or cell phones to record the audio and then we had these really inexpensive lapel microphones that people could clip on. And then we did not have them transcribed, they just coded their data and, and pulled out some key quotes. Um, so it's not publishable necessarily, but it was really instructive for us. So I'll, I'll just pull out a few of the key findings. Um, by focusing on that, that those two neighborhoods, that was really helpful. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but some of the barriers to spending time outside, um, park maintenance was cited, you know, those clean bathrooms that we know are important. Um, and I'll just say too, some of the stuff that we found out wasn't necessarily easy to hear. Um, you know, I work for the parks department and a lot of this was related to parks, even though we intended for it to be a little bit more broad. Um, park maintenance was, was probably the number one barrier there. Um, lack of awareness. So people said, you know, the, the parks were dirty or had trash uh, or graffiti. And I didn't know how to, I don't know how to tell the parks department about that. Um, in fact, the, our Latina researchers kind of summarized and said, people seem to feel that the parks department didn't want to hear from us. And that was just like a knife in the heart. Oh, we do, and it's, it's too bad that doesn't come, come across. But I can understand where that comes from because if you go to one of our parks, you might see a sign that says, call this number if there's a problem. But in most of our parks, that doesn't exist. We don't have a sign like that. Um, and in fact, we had a we have a phone number called Park Watch, and it was really I called it just to find out what would happen. And you know, it was like option three was uh, file a work order, which was which is that park maintenance piece, and that's internal language. No external person's going to know what that means, right? And then uh, if you pressed that number, it rang to the Como Zoo Conservatory Visitor Center. So hopefully we have that fixed now. <laughs> But yeah, that, that does communicate, you know, uh, that, that maybe we need to do a little bit better at, um, you know, being open to hearing what people have to say. Um, so lack of awareness of those reporting mechanisms. Park rules was a really big thing, um, which was surprising to me, but it made sense. So uh, we have a lot of Muslim residents and dogs are considered dirty. And if you're at a park and there's a dog off leash and it comes bounding up to you and licks your hand and maybe jumps on you, you're probably not going to want to go back to that park. Uh, anytime soon. And a lot of our parks don't allow dogs off leash and that rule is not necessarily followed. But if there's no sign that says, you know, please keep your dog on a leash, people might not know that they should keep their dog on a leash. Or if you're a visitor, you might not be able to go up to somebody and say, excuse me, could you keep your dog on a leash? Um, somebody might get defensive and say, I don't see a sign that says I can't have my dog on a leash, right? Another really interesting anecdote, there was a Somali man who said, you know, a lot of People in my community are afraid to break rules in the park because back in Kenya, um, if you broke a rule, then you'd get shaken down by a park security or police officer for a bribe. And in, in 
in Kenya, in the parks in Kenya, you can't walk on the grass. Um, so, you know, you, you would be nervous going into a park and there's all this grass everywhere and you're not sure what those rules are um, and you don't want to have to pay a bribe to somebody. Um, another issue, uh, we have a, a lot of undocumented in immigrants who are part of our, our study here. And, you know, the sight of a, a police officer would be kind of unnerving. You know, if I don't know what the park rules are, I might break one and I might have a, an encounter with park security police that could have some really big impacts on my life and my family's life. Um, the lack of awareness of amenities, we heard from people saying, well, I like to go biking at, around Lake Salem, but I don't really know where else I can do that in St. Paul. So we, we need to make sure that people know what else is in our system beyond what is right outside their door. And then we heard a lot, there's a lot of consternation about a private park, and I'm so glad we focused on this little subsection of the city because we could then go in and figure out which park are they talking about. And they were talking about a park that has these beautiful athletic fields, the top-notch, great, but they're gated off, locked to the public um, because they are leased to a local high school. And people did not understand why, why this was not accessible, and, you know, I did some some investigations and found out that uh, the, the local high school, when, when the public was used to, was able to use those fields, it would deteriorate the quality of those fields. And so they, they gated them off, and, and now, now the fields can be used by, for high school play. But there are no signs on the, on the property that would indicate to anybody why, you know, who, who operates this property, um, why are these not open to the public all the time, et cetera. Um, Another big concern, which was touched on earlier, safety and security, which is so complicated. Um, we had a, a mother-daughter pair that were interviewed together, and um, the mother said, well, I would just feel a lot more comfortable being in this park if, I, if there was a police officer or park security person there. And the daughter said, no, no, no. If there was somebody like that in the park, I would not want to go there, <laughs> you know, because I might be harassed. If I'm there with my friends, um, I might, you know, might be viewed as, as doing nefarious things in the park when really we're not. Um, racially motivated bias, this went some different directions too. You know, that park is uh, frequented by a certain uh, racial group and so it's, therefore it's not safe. Um, so making a lot of assumptions there. Um, and also kind of going back to that, well, if I go there, if I'm a person of color and I go there with my friends, the neighbors might call the police. We have an example actually, um, at Sunray Library, there was a, an overnight campout in the park that is just adjacent to the library space. A group of African American youth uh, with, with some youth workers and, and library staff. The police were called in the middle of the night to, their, to, to that campout four times. And, and so you can imagine, like, what kind of a camping experience is that when you're woken up, you know, four times in the middle of the night by police with neighbors making this assumption that you're not, you're up to no good. Um, another security uh, or safety issue that people brought up was that access to shade and water, especially in these hot summers that we have, um, making sure that, that uh, drinking fountains work or that there are drinking fountains, that we do have adequate shade and shade in the right places. Um, that incomplete sidewalk grid, we did have somebody say that, you know, I like to go to the certain park, but in order to get there, I have to walk, I have to you know, roll my stroller in the street with my toddler holding my hand and it, it feels really unsafe and I don't, it makes me not want to go there. Um, and then crime, you know, we, we're a large city, we do have some crime in our parks and sometimes that really lives large in community memory. So that's that park where that happened, that terrible thing happened and so now we don't go there anymore. Um, and then there's also a perceived safety, kind of that eyes on the park. We have a lot of parks along our river uh, and it's down below the bluff. Um, large wooded areas. We do actually have homeless uh, people in living, living in several of our parks. Um, but it's not like there's a, a huge number of people down there, and so um, it might feel like it's not very safe. And so that's a, a deterrent also. And then sometimes uh, there was an amenities mismatch. You know, we said, what do, what do you want to see? And um, one of my favorite things was uh, from the Hmong subgroup uh, of respondents. People said they wanted beauty. Um, and so we are actually in our implementation phase are going to look into that a little bit more. So, okay, beauty, what does that mean to you? Um, because 
that can mean something different to a lot of people. Um, and our researchers thought it probably meant flowers, but okay, a native garden or a formal rose garden or how big would it have to be? Um, so these are all just brought up a lot more questions for us. So when our team, um, including our community researchers, came together to come up with an implementation plan for St. Paul, uh, we, we wanted to, to hit some different criteria. We wanted this to be um, kind of a grassroots plan. Uh, we wanted to build on the strengths that we have in St. Paul. We wanted to be financially sustainable, long-lasting, equitable, and have a sizable impact. So we came up with three primary strategies. And number one was, was improving that relationship between the parks department and communities of color, making sure that our park rules are really visible and easy to understand, um, that we find out you know, how do people want to learn about amenities? Which amenities do they want to know most about? How can we find out more about um, beauty and, and other things that people were asking for but felt like they didn't see in their parks around their homes? Um, and also that, that maintenance um, communication piece as well. We're also going to expand our Nature Smart, we are in the process of expanding our Nature Smart Library program. Um, so this is a, a Nature Smart backpack here with uh, different resources to get outside and, and learn about um, I think nocturnal animals, perhaps. And then we are also going to be establishing a day camp along the Mississippi River at Hidden Falls Regional Park in partnership with the YMCA. And what we will do is offer uh, spots to kids in our youth programs throughout the city through our Rockets Network at a subsidized rate and introduce uh, all these youth to uh, the nature that is right here in our city. Um, really high quality uh, nature, natural areas in, in Hidden Falls Regional Park. And um, we're going to be bringing together, we're going to drive down the cost of that by bringing together all these different programming partners, including the National Park Service, um, Parks and Recreation. Uh, we actually have Sky Girls from TPT wanting to be involved as well. So a lot of really great um, partnership there to, to enhance our programming and uh, make it a really rich experience for you. And I just wanted to call out a few things that happened that we weren't necessarily expecting to have happen. The youth who interviewed other youth as part of our, our community research are totally passionate about this now. So they want to make sure that everybody knows about the, the benefits of parks and they want to make sure that we address the disparities that we know we have in St. Paul. Um, which I forgot to mention earlier, um, the Met Council studies that were referenced earlier call out the, uh, in particular, the, the racial and ethnic disparities that we're, we have in terms of park use in St. Paul and other areas in the metro. Um, and that's something that, you know, we made sure that the youth and all of our community researchers knew about, and so they want to help us address those disparities. So they want to continue doing interviews, and they also wrote a grant and helped us with uh, our Phelan Freeze Fest event here um, this year, and they, they brought in Heart of the Beast Puppet Theater, and they, they did a performance, they did outreach, um, they, they raised money for um, a door prizes, et cetera, so that was really fun to see, and they were part of our event planning team for that event. Uh, just, and this is something that could be exciting in, in your city, too, if you just kind of find out, okay, how are people getting uh, engaged, or how are people engaging children with nature? Um, finding out that Public Art St. Paul is doing all this great work. So now we're going to be working with them on their pollinator bike program. <laughs> and then um, I wanted to mention, too, because this could affect people throughout the state of Minnesota, um, our Nature Smart Library initiative uh, has caught the attention of the Minnesota Children and Nature Connection. And they would like to see a toolkit produced and made available to libraries across the state so that anybody um, in any library could become a Nature Smart library. You know, I was thinking about um, Minneapolis Parks that in the last maybe 10 years that a few of them have introduced um, uh, sort of restaurants, uh, like sort of beer garden areas. Is that a controversial thing for parks to have? Well, no, Phelan had, or Como has, oh. Como has a, yeah, has always had a restaurant. Or, or I'm sure Como's outside. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I can speak to that in particular. Um, it's. 
it's my understanding that that's not necessarily, I, I think it's seen as a good thing to have more of those amenities available in our building. Um, I think in Salem, there was an effort previously to have a, a food vendor, um, and I, I believe there is still a food truck that has uh, a contract there. So, so that we see as that adding value. I mean, it seems like it's just, just another way to bring people into the Um, you referenced in, in the feedback you got from some of the generational slides, you will never be able to break the differences between the teenage daughter and the parents, but were there things in your implementation plan that were designed to address those, or were there any solutions that you could find for some of those things? We really looked at that issue a lot and had a hard time coming up with sort of that silver bullet, you know. And so I think um, part of that would hopefully be addressed with improving that, that communication between the community and the park department. If um, there, there's always a group of people smoking marijuana at a, a picnic table at a park, well, the park department is going to want to know that and we're going to want to take care of that so that people feel like they can bring their kids to the playground that's next to that park bench. Um, and so, so in an indirect way, we're trying to address that, but we, we decided to, to go after some more low-hanging fruit. Question from the webinar. Uh, what's the status of community gardens in St. Paul, and how important are they in your park strategy, including promotion and financial support? That's a great question. I'm not the best person to answer that question. Um, we have a number of community gardens in St. Paul, and uh, we have a policy that's friendly toward them, um, and, and I, I can say our park department sees the value in them. Uh, we do have a new position um, that was, we, we had somebody who is our arts gar and gardens coordinator who recently left, and we are, are shifting that position uh, to expand our um, food and nutrition aspect of, so we'll have a garden coordinator who can do uh, handle the community gardens and also add some more educational uh, aspects to that position. So we're excited to do that. I'm curious about um, the language barriers that you have identified and, and what does the plan entail in terms of signage in parks with different languages? Are you focusing that information on internet and website resources or what? We aren't at that phase quite yet, but uh, the DNR is undergoing a, a process to change their, their rural signage, and so we are in contact with them to learn about their process and how they're doing that. They are using icons um, and using short phrases. So a lot of times when it, when it comes to language barriers, it's usually that people might be able to, to speak or read some amount, but if you give them a wall of text, as we have in St. Paul <laughs> for rural, um, you know, an English speaker is going to, you know, uh, a native English speaker is going to look at that and say, I'm not going to spend 10 minutes reading the fine print on that sign, thank you very much. Um, but if you have an, an image, an icon, with, you know, a, a short phrase, um, we, we hope that that can make it more accessible. Um, and then, you know, online there are a lot of translating services, and so we can look at ways, you know, what we're going to do is do, do more research to find out how do people want to get this information and, and get that feedback from them. Like, will this work for you and will this not? So. A couple more from the webinar. Um, one, this is an earlier question, and I'm sorry, I skipped it before, um, about the Frogtown Garden, if you know anything about um, its budget or is it break even? I don't, Jenna might know more about that project. Um, the Frogtown Farm is a, independent 501c3 organization, and so contacting Procom Farm might be the best way to go there. Um, they're totally separate from, from the park department. Okay, then there's a couple other questions. Um, how are you making use of underused urban space, such as underused street space, excess parking, parking lot, alleys, et cetera, to help get people outside? That's a big question. <laughs> and I, as environmental education coordinator, I'm not sure I have the, the, the viewpoint on the whole parks department for that. Um, I know there are a number of events in town that, like open streets, which 
shutting down, down um, big streets for, for community hospitals and things like that. I don't know, maybe Jenna could speak uh, more to that aspect. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking about pocket parks, you know, uh, like in Minneapolis we have a uh, Milwaukee Avenue which has tiny, tiny little parks set up. I'm not sure, is that a trend? Uh, I would say that uh, we're on the early edge of a trend of looking at creative places to put green space in all of its forms. Green alleys is a trend. There's, there's a city of LA where they're building out alleys to be stormwater management um, areas, but also cleaned up. People can, kids can safely play in the alleys. So that's one example of creative uses. We're seeing more parks across the country being built under freeway um, overpasses. Um, that provides some shelter, so like uh, uh, <coughs> skating, roller skate, or not roller skate, no, um, skate park <laughs> underneath an overpass. Um, so there's a lot of trends about these smaller parks and creative location of parks that are emerging. Um, and again, it goes to this create really maximizing land use most efficient. But in St. Paul, there's one alley that's a green alley, as I understand. It's my library. That's my library. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I really like the Nature Smart backpack idea. I think that's so cool. Do you think you'd ever expand that to rec centers at parks? That's a great question. Um, right now, what what the library system is trying to do is define what Nature Smart being a Nature Smart library means. And people have really grabbed hold of the backpack idea because it's very tangible and easy to understand. Uh, but we want to want to think about it in terms of blending. So it might be a seed library instead of Nature Adventure backpack. It might be, um, and then there's the, the programming aspect, the, the on-site nature access piece of it. Um, some of our libraries are, are really landlocked and surrounded by concrete. Um, so what does that mean if they let Rondo Library wanted to become a nature smart library and there's no green space outside? Is, there, is that possible? So those are questions that the library is really trying to grapple with right now when defining what it means to be a nature smart library. One idea that I, I came across um, the other day it was a, a hammock, let's see, hammock, outdoor hammock library. Mm -hmm. And it was this powered bicycle with a rack on the back with books in this sort of turret. And then you put these metal posts out and hang ham hammocks all around, uh, kind of spidering out from the bicycle. And so you can, it's this mobile, mobile outdoor thing where you could just sit in a hammock and read a book. Um, so that could be a nature smart library feature. Um, it could mean so many different things, and uh, Margaret Lamar at the Children and Nature Network would be a good person to ask about um, different ideas that, that she has come up with. Uh, cool. It'd be cool too if, like, you know, you made like different themes for each library depending on the environment too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's sort of an infancy um, yeah. in St. Paul here, and so it'll be interesting to see where how this grows. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alderbo. Maybe coming up with an app for St. Paul Parks where if you just press a button and, then it can, and you can find what you want to do and what park to go to? Yes, we have a Park Finder app. And uh, you know you can check the boxes of things that you want. I want a park with grills and a picnic tables and a playground. And it'll give you, um, it'll give you a list by distance from where your location is. Um, so it'll say, you know, this park is um, you know, a quarter of a mile away, this park is a half mile away, and it'll be look on a map. And it also has programs on there. Uh, not all of our programs because it would be overwhelming. But the Park Finder, if you go to stpaul.gov slash Park Finder, I believe uh, you'll get to that feature. And we're, we're working on developing um, an app that will help with wayfinding along our river parks. Uh, because they're very large, <laughs> hundreds of acres, and you're in the woods, and there are bike trails, you know, going off in all directions, and it's really easy to get turned around. And so right now, um, we have some staff working on that. Another question from the webinar. Um, is there any research showing a connection between having parks and nature education with environmentally responsible behaviors at home? In other words, how big a priority should it be for a city to offer more widespread youth and adult nature and sustainability education in order to shift consumer and citizen action? That's a great question. And I would probably point to Kathy Jordan uh, as a 
a researcher with Children Nature Network to answer that one. Yeah, so um, I, I would say that this is sort of like a, a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs sort of thing. Like, you know, at the, the bottom, most foundational thing is you need, uh, you need access to and exposure to nature so that you feel like you've got a connection to a place. But a lot of the research is, is demonstrating that that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, or doesn't translate into um, sustainability behaviors at home where you don't necessarily grow up to be an environmental steward uh, because of that connection. It might take other things. Um, and I think we're still trying to figure out exactly what those things are. But things like um, some mentoring around that, for example, mentoring programs just you know, shown to be, be helpful in that way. Um, so, um, so it's been great. If you don't have the access, um, you're not going to be able to get to the other levels, but that's probably not sufficient in and of itself. I would add, I was thinking of, of a project that our local s school did, which was the kids were down uh, picking along the river um, 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 buckthorn um, seedlings, and and then they, and then I think the teacher put in all the, all the, um, yeah, there was like a flyer that the kids took home, and that was, uh, and that sort of led to a project the neighbor group did, where the people who had buckthorn hedges or, or and we had a project to sort of start to take out the buckthorn because it just obliterates the spring of emeralds, especially. So there is this way of kids doing things. And then taking a flyer to their parents and harassing their parents. <laughs> and that's how recycling started. You know, it was a school-based you know, program to get kids aware. And then the kids went home and got their parents to do it at home. So the camp is definitely done. Yeah. Uh, but you, you know, there's something intentional beyond just sort of a, yeah, the beyond the access to nature. Yeah. Last summer, I was working with kids in St. Paul um, on a Environmental engineering uh, summer class, and they were looking at the nice drive setup. Loved those solar panels, and they looked at a map and, and did some things with that. But um, were disappointed that there weren't kids signs as part of the nice drive. Mm -hmm. uh, they did some research behind it and found that it was a liability issue. Is that true? Is there any way to move that forward with kids bikes on with nice rides? That sounds like a great question for nice, right? I will say um, I worked at the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, and they have a, a through a grant from the Minnesota Department of Transportation, they have a bike fleet that we have access to because we have a licensed cycling instructor uh, on our staff, and we can we can lead rides. And the youngest uh, we can have out there is age eight, because according to uh, Mindas research, that is the earliest that you would want a, a child riding. Uh, you know, in the street and having sort of developmentally ready to do something like that. Um, what is your view about the benefits and challenges of apps like Pokemon Go? Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I am not anti-technology outside. I think um, there are so many ways to get people engaged in the, in the outdoors. And um, I think Pokemon Go, has helped people find new places that they never would have found otherwise. Um, hopefully they took a minute to look away from their screen um, and see what was actually in front of them. Um, but I think as with, with just about everything in life, it's a balance. And um, you just don't want to go too far towards something like that. Any other questions? How did the district council problems with that? They were involved, or some, the, that smaller area of the city that we worked on, we did meet with um, the staff in that area um, as we were planning this. And uh, just to learn more about the local um, civic organizations and, and community groups and how they were doing outreach. Um, but there, there wasn't deep involvement from district council. Thank you very much.